you realize that 80% of all college graduates today move back into home with their parents after graduation because they don't have a job? 80%. Of the 20% of college students who graduate, only the 20% can find a job in their career field. 80% don't have a job in their career field. I've known PhD graduates who are driving a taxi cab. Some, some states like Ohio have outlawed collective bargaining, so don't rest your hope on the union. Get sick with a serious illness. I know that you don't think that will happen to you, but I think I'm correct on this figure. 24 million people in the U.S. don't have health insurance, or was it 46? Anyway, it's a lot of people that don't have health insurance? 46% 40, 46 don't have health insurance? Under, underinsured or not insured. Underinsured if not insured. Here's the thing. Find yourself homeless. Ask any single person who's homeless and they'll tell you they didn't expect to be homeless. They didn't expect to lose their job. They didn't expect to be kicked out of their house or get a divorce. Find yourself homeless. Good luck because all the shelters are full. There's no place for you to go. So the first reason is that to get involved in some aspect, it may be the best hope for improving your own future. Second reason is that I think this movement, because it's a grassroots movement, offers a chance to create real fundamental change in the long term. I think that's why it's here to stay. Occupy sites, whether they have tents or they don't have tents whether there were a protest movement of uh, trashing the mayor's lawn, okay, um, are meant to keep the movement in front of the eyes of the people, to keep the awareness and consciousness up. Something's wrong. Something has to be done. And if they take down the tents, we'll erect something else, maybe a giant woodpecker, and we'll have a mascot, okay? But there will always be some visible reason to keep the movement in front of the people because the, greaky, uh, the squeaky wheel, okay, gets the attention. In Europe, major revolutions started with intellectuals meeting in cafes for discussion. One thing about communities and the Occupy movement is that they are opportunities for you to talk and communicate with your fellow citizens. These are communities. Whether they're small communities of six people out here on a Raria campus, or uh, 120 people in downtown Denver, or 500 people in Oakland, or across the world, these are people living together in communities, some full-time, some dropping in, and they're talking to each other because they are desperately concerned with the way our world community seems to be falling apart. Be a part of that community. You don't have to camp, you don't have to pitch a tent, but stop by and talk. Ask questions. Get to know these people, okay? They're on your side. They're your friends. I'd like to um, tell you another th reason why I think um, it's important that we, we take action. Our society is getting less and less equal. Inequality poisons a society. And that poison will spread and infect you, even if you're not interested and not involved. And a British epidemiologist, Richard Wilkinson, say that real fast, epidemiologist, Richard Wilkinson. Here's what he says about unequal societies and how they poison communities. In less equal societies, we find perhaps eight times the number of teenage births compared with a normal society. Ten times the homicide rate compared to a normal society. Three times the rate of mental illness that an unequal society has compared with a normal society. We know from the findings that it's the status divisions themselves that create the problems. Inequality also has psychological effects. The impact of living with anxiety about our feelings of superiority or inferiority. If you grew up in an unequal society, your actual experience of human relationships is different. 
your idea of human nature changes. For instance, in more equal countries or more equal states, two-thirds of the population may feel that they can trust others in general, whereas in the more unequal countries or states, it may drop as low as 15 or 25 percent. If you grew up and lived in the time of the civil rights revolutions, as some of you did and as I did, you know what I'm talking about, whether you were black or white, rich or poor. Here are some ways that I think you can get involved. And these suggestions come from a newly published paperback called This Changes Everything uh, about the Occupy movement, just published. Number one, get informed. If you don't know what's going on, stop by and ask somebody. This problem is more serious than what you may realize. Number two, be visible. Don't let the uh, issue disappear because your visibility for getting the message across has disappeared. Number three, support those who are more actively involved in the Occupy movement. That may be uh, bringing blankets, bringing clothes, bringing coats, just saying a word of encouragement. Um, in one case, uh, I wanted to get some flyers. I didn't have money to make the flyers. A student stopped by and said, here, give me a flyer. I'll go make 500 copies for you. Four, insist that public officials treat the occupation with respect. At this stage, uh, where'd Jason go? Uh, uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to show you this video. And then after the video, I have a closing quotation about the one person over in Egypt that probably was responsible for starting this whole Occupy movement called A Letter to a Dead Person. But first, let's hear how this sergeant who comes back from the Marine Corps is so it's actually a letter to a dead man. And it's published in this book I was talking about, This Changes Everything. Dear young man who died on the fourth day of the turbulent 2011, dear Mohammed Busasi, I want to write you about an astonishing year with three months yet to run. I want to tell you about the power of despair and the margins of hope and the bonds of civil society. I wish you could see the way that your small life and large death became a catalyst for the fall of so many dictators in what is known as the Arab Spring. We are now in some sort of an American fall. Civil society here has suddenly hit the ground running and we are all headed toward a future no one imagined when you, a young Tunisian vegetable seller capable, capable of giving so much, who instead had so much taken from you, burned yourself to death to protest your impoverished and humiliated state. You lit yourself on fire on December 17, 2010, exactly nine months before the Occupy Wall Street began. Your death two weeks later would be the beginning of so much. You lit yourself on fire because you were voiceless you were powerless and evidently without hope. And yet you must have had one small hope left, that your death would have an impact, that you, who had so few powers, even the power to make a decent living or protect your modest possessions to be treated fairly and decently by the police, had the power to protest. As it turned out, you had that power beyond your wildest dreams. And you had it because your hope, however diminished, was the dream of the many, the dream of what we are now started to call the 99%. One person can make a difference. You can make a difference. So I challenge you to look around. A notable speaker once said, the smallest package I ever saw was a, pass uh, was a person wrapped up totally in themselves. <laughs> so look around you, get your head out of the ground like an ostrich, look beyond your own interest, see what you can do as one person to make a difference. I'm Don Peterson, faculty at CCD, and I'm one of the 99%.